Well, good evening. This is Bobby Stafford with the Granby Church of Christ in Granby, Missouri. And tonight we're going to be looking at faith and be following uh, some notes by Carl Cooper uh, on this very important topic of being saved by faith and what that means. We will begin, and I hope you have your Bibles, by looking at one of the most familiar verses in the Old Test or in the New Testament, and that's John three sixteen. Uh, so, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, and follow along, we will begin looking there at that most familiar verse, which will serve as the introduction to uh, this evening's lesson on being saved by faith. I think most people in the world are very, uh, very familiar with John three sixteen, probably more so than any other verse in the entire uh, Bible. But I want us to begin actually in John chapter three, verse 14, and read 14, 15, and 16, and I'll be reading from the New King James. Um, and this will also serve as how we end the lesson today, these same verses. Well, John three, verse 14 says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, you might ask, what in the world does Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness have to do with being saved uh, by faith? And how could lifting up the serpent save anyone? Well, that is really what this lesson is going to end up being about. What does that have to do with being saved by faith? I think most people in what we would call the Protestant world uh, believes in salvation by faith, but we're going to look at what the Bible says about what kind of faith saves them. Is it any kind of faith? Is it mere belief? What is this uh, being saved by faith? Uh, we're going to go back to the Old Testament first, and then we'll end up in the New Testament. We're going to examine some very uh, common stories, uh, accounts that we uh, probably grew up listening to and reading. The first one is the story of Noah and the Ark, a very uh, common one. And for that, we will go back to Genesis chapter 6. And if you have your Bibles and are following along, <clears throat> Let's go back to Genesis 6, and we'll read a couple of verses. Let's begin with verse 13. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. We skip down to verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife and your son's wives with you. <clears throat> and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Well, verse 22 says, Then Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So at the end of that verse, or that text, it says, Noah did all that God commanded him to do. Well, what was that? Well, he built this enormous ship, this ark, uh, according to the pattern God gave him. And at the time God told him, he entered the ark with uh, his family. And by doing that, all that God told him to do, he was saved. Well, the question is, why did Noah build the ark? You may think that's an unusual question, but think about that for a minute. It took him many, many years to do. Noah had never seen anything like this. He had never seen... Uh, an ark like this, this gigantic ship. He had never seen a flood. So why did he do that? Why did he follow all these complex 
directions and instructions year after year after year. And of course, during that time, he was also preaching. He's called a preacher of righteousness, uh, trying to uh, get people to listen and to uh, do what he said, <clears throat> telling people there was a great flood coming. So why did Noah do it? Why did Noah go to all this trouble? We know why he did it. It was because of faith. That's why Noah did it. He had faith in Jehovah God that Jehovah would do exactly what he said he would do. <clears throat> so when sometimes I think it's appropriate to distinguish between just believing and having faith. Um, in James chapter 2 and verse 14, James makes a, a very important uh, point in his writing about this very thing. In James chapter 2, verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? In other words, can faith alone save him? Can faith that doesn't have works or doesn't obey, can faith without obedience save? That was the That's the real question tonight. Can faith without obedience save? So let's be honest. If Noah had refused to obey God and had not built the ark, do you think he would have been saved? Well, I think everybody knows the answer to that. No, he would not have been. He would have been destroyed along with everybody else. Or what if Noah did build the ark, but maybe he's, he thought the instructions for God were, were too difficult or the ark was too big or it was too difficult to get the wood that God wanted. Um, so what if he had changed God's plans? Would that uh, have been enough faith to save Noah? Well, of course not. Noah was saved because he had enough faith to obey God and do exactly what God told him to do. That's what it was all about. So that's one instance of what kind of faith saves and certainly the faith that Noah had in God was the kind of faith that led him to obey, and that faith led him to salvation. It wasn't faith alone that saved him, but it was the faith that led him to obey that saved. What about another example? What about the Old Testament patriarch Abraham? And of course, there are, we have lots and lots of stories about Abraham and various things that uh, he do he did ways that he demonstrated his uh, faith <clears throat> to do what God told him to do. And of course, the one uh, that we think about more than any is when he was told to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And recall that uh, Abraham and Sarah had uh, wanted a child for some time, and so finally, in their old age, the Bible says they uh, have a son uh, by the name of Isaac, and uh, recall that Abraham had been promised uh, that, promised by God, that through him, uh, all the nations of the world would be blessed, and his descendants would be more than the stars in the heaven. And so him and Sarah wait and wait and wait, and they, they finally have Isaac, and then God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. Well, let's hear again what James says about this in James chapter 2, verse 20 and following. James chapter 2 and verse 20 and following. It says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? In other words, it's useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When, and there's the time element that's so important, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or complete or fulfilled. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That is a, 
extremely relevant example of what we're talking about here uh, in this uh, lesson on what kind of faith saves and when does it save. Well, just uh, like in Noah's case, <clears throat> would Abraham's faith uh, have been enough to save him if he had refused to sacrifice his son Isaac? If when God told him to take his son Isaac there on the mountain and, and sacrifice him and Abraham said, no, I'm not going to, he's my only son. Would that faith have saved Abraham? Of course not. The Bible tells us that, just like we read in verse 23, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Many people misunderstand that to say that when Abraham believed God, he was saved then. But is that what the text says? No. <clears throat> it says he was called the friend of God and he was uh, accounted, it was accounted to him for righteousness when? When his faith worked. Our, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? It wasn't when he believed uh, what God said. It was when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Abraham, his faith caused him to obey God. And it was then, it was then and only then that it was accounted to him for righteousness. It wasn't when he believed. It was when his faith caused him to obey. And James says there where we, where we read that this kind of faith is the kind that it takes to save someone because it's strong enough to obey whatever God tells you to do. James says there by inspiration, the Holy Spirit, God himself wrote that, that faith alone is not enough to save. In other words, when we say that, we're saying that faith is what leads to salvation. But faith alone, like James says, like God says, faith alone by itself never saves. It's only when that faith gives us the possibility to receive salvation. It's not enough to save by itself. Matter of fact, James says the devil and demons have that kind of faith. And it's not enough to save. So just because people believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that alone would never save anyone. The kind of faith that saves is the kind of faith that Noah had and that Abraham had. It's the kind of faith that will cause us to obey whatever God tells us to do. Well, let's fast forward all the way to today. <clears throat> so if faith alone will not save us, what kind of faith will it take to save us? And when does that faith actually save? Has God given us instructions? Has God revealed that to us? Well, he absolutely has. <clears throat> One thing he said that we must do, believers, is to repent. In Luke chapter 13, in verses 3 and 5, he, he basically repeats it and he says, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, uh, that is the, the famous sermon uh, of Paul uh, in Athens on Mars Hill. <clears throat> Toward the end of that, he says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked, but now he does what? Commands all men everywhere to repent. So the kind of faith that will lead one to salvation, that brings the possibility of salvation, is the kind of faith that will motivate one to repent, to make that important change in one's life, where they go from focusing on their own desires and will and, and, and pleasures to doing what God wants them to do. Is there anything else? Well, there's still more instructions. If we go to Romans chapter 10, we notice something that Paul told 
the Christians there in Rome. He says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto, unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Both of those verses point to the important fact that confession and belief lead to, all right, give us that possibility of salvation, of forgiveness of sins, of eternal life. So we, we're told here now that the kind of faith that's going to save us today is the kind of faith that leads us to repent and leads us to make that great confession in whom we believe, and that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <clears throat> Jesus himself said in Matthew 10, <coughs> verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. What happened on the day of Pentecost? We know Going back to Acts chapter 2, remember this happens <clears throat> not too long after Jesus' ascension into heaven. The Jews are all uh, there in Jerusalem. <coughs> and so Peter and the other 11 apostles gets up after they've been filled with the Holy Spirit so that they're able to uh, miraculously speak in languages they had never learned. <clears throat> they speak to the people. <clears throat> Those people <coughs> become believers in Jesus Christ. Many of them do. We, we see at the end several thousand. They become believers. They are the Bible says they're cut to the heart. This, this is where that change comes about that we call repentance. They realize that what they've done was wrong. Now notice what happens here in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, many people in the crowd, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do for what? What has he been talking about? Salvation, if you go back to verse 21. What shall we do to be saved? They weren't saved yet. They were, they were believers. They had faith. Uh, they certainly were cut to the heart. They had repented, but they also knew they weren't saved. So what does Peter tell them they need to do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority. For what? For the remission, another word would be forgiveness, of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so Peter and the other apostles said, this is what you need to do. Your faith needs to be such that you will obey God by doing what? Repenting and then being baptized, which means to be immersed. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> so there is the faith that leads one to salvation. It's the faith that is strong enough to repent. Repentance may be the hardest thing in the Bible to do. It's where we turn away from self-will and we become selfless because now we are listening to what God the Father wants us to do and not what we ourselves want to do. And that's tough to do. We turn away from our old life, our old uh, bad habits, our old sins, and we turn our lives over to God and confess that we believe that and we're going to live as if Jesus is our Lord. <clears throat> That's the kind of faith that saves. Well, it's the kind of faith that Noah had because Noah believed God 
and then acted upon it. It's the kind of faith that Abraham had. Abraham had faith in God and then acted upon it. <clears throat> so let's end where we were started, going back to John chapter 3. What does looking after the serpent have to do with what we've talked about uh, all night? <clears throat> to understand that, we want to go back to Numbers 21. This is where this uh, comes from. This is where this account of the brass serpent comes from. In Numbers 21, and we'll just read verse 9 there. Numbers 21 and verse 9. This is what it says. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So what is the, why did Jesus give us that to think about when he said, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life? What do those two things have to do? Well, let's read one more time, John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Old Testament account, what did those people have to do? Did they have to believe that when they looked on the pole, that brass serpent, that they would be saved? Sure. Did they have to look at the brass serpent? That's what the Bible says. They had to look. So their faith was the kind that led them to obey. And that faith saved when, at the point of obedience, when they looked at the pole, when they looked at this brass bronze serpent. So similarly for us today, <clears throat> It takes action on our part before faith saves. We don't just believe in God or believe in Jesus Christ or believe that he died on the cross. That belief, just like those people in the Old Testament, must produce action. We must do what God says. So faith leads to, brings about the possibility of salvation. But just as we read in James, no one is ever saved by faith alone.